so the title of my talk is Kim's Conjecture and Effective Faultings. Maybe it was Effective Faultings and Kim's Conjecture, one way or the other. Um, so my name is David Corwin. I'm postdoc at MSRI slash UC Berkeley. Um, I do hear a bit of feedback. Um, not sure if there's a specific reason for that. Um, so I, I was told that, that you want to focus on conjectures in this seminar. Um, and so at the beginning, I'm going to focus actually on some conjectures. And then toward the end, I'm going to talk about specific details from our ICERM project. Um, so that will be at the very end. Um, and so the first part is, I want to talk about is the quest slash conjecture for an effective faultings and a related conjecture, Kim's conjecture, that might help us do something with that. So yeah. just make sure there's, yeah. So in the chat, you can find my slides. So what is, what is faultings theorem and effective faultings about? So a basic question is given a polynomial in two variables with integer coefficients, can we find a rational solution to it? And if so, how many rational solutions are there? Are there none? Are there a finite number? And can we find that finite number? Or are there infinitely many? Now, as I'm sure you guys know, such a polynomial defines an algebraic curve. And that curve has a genus. And the genus tells us a lot about how that question looks. That question of, are there solutions? And if so, how many? And so Faulting's theorem is about the case g is greater than or equal to 2, which is that the set of rational solutions is finite. And so I'm going to focus on that case. But if you're interested in the general question of determining the number of rational solutions to such a polynomial f of x comma y, then well, in the genus 0 case, there's either 0 or infinitely many solutions. And there's sort of an algorithm to, to figure out the answer to the question above. And if g equals one, well, it's either an elliptic curve or if there are no points, a torsor under an elliptic curve. And there are methods to deal with that, um, many of which relate to the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture. But so my focus is the question of effective faultings, which is when there are finitely many solutions, how do you find all of the solutions? Now, in practice, okay, often you can find the solutions by just searching through points of bounded height and getting at least a conjectural list of solutions. But the question is, how do you know that you've listed all of the solutions? And so one method for, for trying to prove that your list is finite, which is really the essential problem in doing effective faultings, is the shebote coleman method. And what that does is the method produces some piatic analytic functions. And the theory behind the method tells you that those functions vanish on all of the solutions to the Diophantine equation, on all of the rational points. And once you have these piatic analytic functions, which you can express as power series, you can use a, a version of Newton's method, specifically Newton's polygons, Newton, po Newton polygons, to determine where the zeros are. Um, and determine the number of zeros. And for various reasons that I'll talk about later, Shebote Coleman works only in certain situations. And Kim's non abelian Shebote's method is expected to work in much more generality, possibly in all generality, as I'll get to in the next slide. But so the refined problem is finding these piatic analytics, specifically a specific kind called Coleman functions, on the set of piatic points of the algebraic curve that vanish on the set of rational points, which allows you to prove in many cases that your set of, that your list of rational points is complete. Now, let me just give, before um, I actually talk about the limits or possible limits of Kim's non-abelian Chebotis method, I'm just going to go, go through a couple of examples. So simpler example, um, is S integral points on P1 minus three points. I know this is not a smooth projective hyperbolic curve, um, but it's still hyperbolic sort of as an affine curve in a certain sense. And so there's a similar theorem that the set of S integral points on such a curve is finite. 
And so for a positive integer n, okay, so, so, the, so s is gonna be the set of primes dividing n, we may ask about the z adjoin one over n points on p1 minus three points. Now this is the same as asking about pairs of s units x and y. That means that the numerator and denominator of x and y in lowest terms are divisible only by primes dividing n and such that x plus y equals one. And this is really, this was the first case in which, in which Min Young Kim developed his method and it's a good testing ground for more general methods. And so for a very simple example, for capital N equals two, there are three solutions corresponding to X equals two negative one and one half, and Y is of course one minus X. And so Don Cohen and Favors back in 2013 found the following function, um, which is written in terms of what are called polylogarithms. Um, if you want to know more about them, um, you can look them up. I don't have time to get into them, but there's, there's piatic versions of polylogarithms. They give you piatic analytic functions. And so the following function written in terms of piatic polylogarithms vanishes on the set of um, integral points as long as P is not two. And it was verified using the Newton's method, using, using the Newton polygon method, that for P is five or seven, this function has only those three zeros. Um, I think actually it might've been verified for P equals three as well, but I, I definitely know it was verified for P equals five and seven because I used that in some later work. Um, okay, so that's, that's one example. Here's another example in which the method was used to prove that a given list of solutions was actually the complete list. Um, and this is sort of a more spectacular example because it was really something that people did not know how to do using previous methods. And so this was for the modular curve, uh, the split Carton modular curve of 13. Um, and what this does is this, this parameterizes elliptic curves whose Galois action on the 13 torsion points factors through a, through a split Carton subgroup. Now, it, turn, it turns out that, a, so a, just to give you something concrete, um, you can write this curve using the homogeneous equation listed above. And you can check if you'd like that the seven points listed there are indeed solutions to that homogeneous equation. Okay, that's just a matter of a finite amount of computation. The question is, of course, showing that that is the set of all of the rational points. And this is what, what um, was done by Balakrishnan, Dogra, Muller, Tautman, and Vonk, Funk in, in a seminal paper that really showed how powerful the Shebotikim method was. So now I just want to talk about the, the general, let's say, limits, possible limits of the Shebotikin method. So what, what it does is for a positive integer n, um, and, and the idea is that you want to let n get arbitrarily large or get, let n get sufficiently large is a better way to say it. Um, you get a set of piatic analytic Coleman functions that I didn't write this down, but that vanish on the set of rational points of your curve. And there's some conjectures on Galois cohomology that at least show that for sufficiently large n, you get at least one non-zero function. And a basic fact about Coleman functions is that they always have finitely many zeros, at least finitely many zeros on a compact set. And if your curve is projective, then the set of piatic points is compact. And so the conjectures on Galois cohomology tell you that for n sufficiently large, you get a finite bound on the set of rational points, okay? However, what you'd like is not just a finite bound, but you'd like to know that the set of rational points you found is precisely the set of all rational points. And so for example, if one had found a function for, for the split Carton of 13, this is not what happened, but just to illustrate the point, if you had found a function that by Newton's method has nine zeros, well, then you would know that there are at most nine rational points but you wouldn't necessarily know for sure that there aren't two other rational points in addition to the seven that you already listed. And so Kim's conjecture states that in fact, for n sufficiently large, not only is the set of common zeros of those functions finite, which happens as soon as you have a non-zero Coleman function, but in fact, it's precisely x of q. 
Um, and this is this is a, this is a conjecture from a from a paper of um, it's Kim Balakrishnan, Don Cohen Vavers. And hopefully, I'm not forgetting anyone from 2014. Um, and actually, there's a sort of there's a later refined conjecture, which is a little bit technical, which 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 is asking the fact that that the scheme of common zeros is precisely x of q. In other words, none of the function there, there's no common multiple root of the functions, which has to do with the issues of piadic approximation. Um, technically, if 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 a function if a piadic analytic function has a double root in some piadic disk, then you can't actually verify that that it has only a double root. You can only verify that it has at most two roots in that disk. So that's that's a slight technical issue. Now for n equals one, this is classical Chebotese method. So really making n larger and larger is going further and further away from classical Chebotese method and ideally becoming more and more powerful. Now the quadratic Chebotese method of Balakrishnan at all computes part, at least part of this, this um, set of functions for the case n equals two. And this, this has been very successful in particular for the the split Carton modular curve of 13 mentioned in the previous slide. Um, but in theory, um, there are, I mean, not just in theory, one can write down curves for which quadratic Chevaux T does not apply. On the other hand, Kim's conjecture would tell you that in theory, for sufficiently large n, non-abelian Chevaux T's method is going to give you an effective faultings. And so I'm currently involved in work with Don Cohen and Vavers trying to sort of develop a method that would apply to all positive integers n. Um, and we're working on like specific case for n equals three right now. Great. So now that I've sort of told you the lay of the land, what the conjectures are and what the hope is for effective fall things, which just to remind you is up here, I'm going to actually tell you where these piadic analytic functions come from. Okay, until now I've just told you that there is some method for, for writing down such piadic analytic functions. Now I'm going to tell you where they came, where they come from. So first, I'm going to go over classical Chevotin's method, and the history is that Faulting's theorem was originally a conjecture. It was a conjecture in roughly 1922 that x of q is finite if x is as a I should say smooth projective algebraic curve of genus at least two. And the first proof of this, at least in a number of cases, was by Chevotin using the following method. So you embed X into an abelian variety, J, generally it's Jacobian, and you consider the following diagram. Here you have the rational points of X and of J, as well as the piadic points of X and of J. And J of course has an abelian group structure. And the mordal vey theorem states that the, the set of rational points of J is a finitely generated abelian group. On the other hand, a J of QP well, it has an abelian group structure, but it also actually has a piadic manifold structure. And the long and short of that is that J of QP is up to some torsion, a lattice in a finite dimensional QP vector space. Okay, up, up to some finite torsion, it's essentially going to be ZP to the G, where G is the dimension of J as an algebraic variety. Now, if R it denotes the mordel Vey rank, then when R is less than G, Chabot shows that the intersection of X of QP and J of Q inside J of QP is in fact finite. Um, and, and when I said earlier that Chabot's method applies only in for, to certain curves X, it's really this R less than G condition that makes it not apply to all possible curves. Now, Chabotis method was originally a method in, in the 1940s for proving that the set of rational solutions was finite. Coleman shows how in the situation R is less than G, you can actually use Chabotis method to explicitly, well, to explicitly find a piadic analytic function on the set of piadic points that vanishes on the set of rational points. And using the idea that I mentioned before, that allows you in some cases to provably find the set of rational points. Um, and so more specifically, Coleman defines a notion of piadic integration. Um, and if you have an algebraic differential form, you can, you can take a piadic integral between any two piadic points on the curve or more generally on the Jacobian. 
Um, I should note that this does not depend on a path between B and P. Um, and if you, if you have such a function defined by an algebraic differential form, you can pull back to X of QP to get an analytic function on X of QP. And let's see. Ah, and so what I should, I guess I didn't write this, write this correctly, but what you do is if R is less than G, then the bottom vertical arrow from J of Q to J of QP has image contained in a proper subspace. And the idea is that an algebraic differential form is a functional on Lie of JQP. And so the image of J of Q inside Lie of JQP is contained in a proper vector subspace, which means that you can find a functional on Lie of JQP that vanishes on this proper vector subspace. And so what you do is you take an algebraic differential form omega that vanishes on this proper vector subspace. Okay. Um, so this is this is the the yeah, sorry. So f is f is given by that. I guess I didn't I didn't say it wrong. I didn't write it wrong, but um, anyway. And so what you do is you can pull back that omega and the, uh, really the function defined by integration of your differential form omega to a non-zero function on X of QP that vanishes on X of Q. And then you can actually compute this sort of using an explicit basis for J of Q. And, and I, as I mentioned before, using some sort of Newton's method to understand the zeros of your piatic analytic function. So two problems that arise um, if you want to sort of make this more general and, and maybe attack effective faultings in general is first of all, R can be less than G, in which case um, Chabotis method doesn't apply. And this is important, even if R is less than G, the function that you get from Chabotis Coleman might have more zeros. It's going to have finitely many zeros, but it might have more zeros than the number of zeros in X of Q. And the reason this is really a problem is because you can't actually find precisely the zeros of a piatic analytic function, all you can do is estimate, piatically estimate the zeros and find the number of zeros. And so if, for example, you found seven rational solutions, which, which is sort of, you, you can deal with rational numbers in an exact way, whereas you can deal with piatic numbers only in, a, in, a, in an approximate way. So if you've listed seven rational solutions, well, then you, and, and if you, piatically approximate the zeros of your analytic function and find that there are a seven zeros of your piatic analytic function, then you know that there are exactly seven rational solutions. On the other hand, if you were to find via Newton's method that your piatic analytic function had eight zeros, well, you know that seven of those eight are going to be the seven rational points you found. But for the eighth, for the eighth zero, you can only approximate it piatically. And in particular, you cannot determine whether it's a rational point or just some irrational piatic point. Okay, you cannot determine that using piatic approximation. And that's why you want it to be that the set of zeros, the set of zeros of your piatic analytic function is actually precisely the set of rational points, not just a, super set, a finite superset of the rational points. And so it's really problem two that makes Kim's conjecture important. Because Kim's conjecture tells you that if you go far enough into Kim's non-abelian Chabotis, you conjecturally at least have no extraneous zeros besides the set of rational points. So let me just give you a rough idea of, of how non-abelian Chabotis method goes. And so with non-abelian Chabotis method, well, you really want to get rid of the, the, the role of the Jacobian in this. And so, the, the, the set of rational points of the Jacobian or the mordal Bay group embeds into a Selmer group, um, which is conjecturally an ice, essentially an isomorphism by the BSD conjecture. And it turns out that you can rewrite the Selmer group using the ideas of Bloch and Cotto as a Galois cohomology group in terms of the first homology of X. Now, first homology is the abelianization of the fundamental group. And so non-abelian means, well, instead of using the abelianization of the fundamental group, let's use a non-abelian quotient of the fundamental group. And the idea is that 
we we want to use a, a, a quotient that's not too large and that we can somehow get a handle of. And so I'm not going to define all the terms in the diagram, but I just want to give you a rough idea that there is a diagram that looks similar to, to, to the Chabotie Cohen diagram, which I've written here. And all you have to know is that it depends on n. Okay, it depends on n, and it gets stronger as n gets larger. Um, and then you can define the Coleman functions as sort of what you do is you consider the set of functions on the lower right object vanishing on the image of LOC, that's localization. And then you take those functions vanishing on the image of LOC and pull them back along JN. And that is how you find your piatic analytic functions on X of QP that vanish on X of Q. David, before you go on, uh, there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, is there a conjectural bound on N before we know that our bound on the number of rational zeros is sharp? And that's from Grant Molnar. So it, it, it depends on some, so let's say, data associated to the curve. So let's say if, actually, okay, to be, to be fair, I don't know of a conjectural bound on N to, to actually get enough functions to precisely determine the, the, the set of zeros. What I can do for you is sort of in terms of some data associated with the, essentially with the Jacobian of the algebraic curve, I can tell you how, far, how large N has to be in order to get finiteness. Um, but I don't know of, of any conjecture that, that tells you exactly how large N has to be to get precisely the set of rational points. Hopefully that, um, hopefully that answered the question. So, now let's talk about quadratic Chabotie and eventually the ISERM project. So quadratic Chabotie, so, so Kim's method is sort of this nice general setup and, it, and it, it allows you to prove finiteness without too much trouble, but doing it explicitly and explicitly finding those functions is, is somewhat difficult. And so the quadratic Chabotie method is a very nice way to actually carry out Kim's non-abelian Chabotie method explicitly, at least for part of the case, lowercase n equals two. And this is, this is using piatic heights. And so the thing about piatic heights is that the piatic height pairing, well, it's, it's sort of analogous to the Neron Tate height pairing. So that's where the word height comes from. It's not actually a height in the usual sense, but it's sort of a piatic analog of the Neron Tate height pairing. And so you get a quadratic function on the set, on the mordel Vey group of J. And this piatic height function decomposes as a sum of local heights for each place V of Q. And this local height looks very different depending on what V is. So the most interesting place is V equals P. Um, and then HV is, well, it's actually given by a sort of piatic analytic function. And it, the relationship to the Chabotikian method is that it's given by a certain component of J2. Um, and, and, and to be fair, when I, when I say that there's, there's a piatic height, there's actually sort of a whole host of piatic heights. I'm not gonna get into the details on that, but, but the point is there are, these, there are these piatic heights. Now, if V is of potentially good reduction, HV is trivial, which is fairly nice for a reason I'll go over on the next slide. Um, for, for V not equal to P, so different residue characteristic, but of bad reduction, of, of even, even permanent bad reduction. Well, the image of HV is finite, but it's not trivial. And that's going to get into our ISERM project. But before I get into the ISERM project, let me just remind you about quadratic Chabotie. So first recall from the slide with, with, with classical Chabotie's method, that you have this log map from J of QP to the Lie algebra. Now, if R equals G, um, at least in many cases, that the image of J of Q in, in the Lie algebra is going to span, a, to span the whole vector space. And so what we can do is we can identify, in that case, we can identify the tensorization of the mordal Vey group with QP with this Lie algebra. And so since H goes into a, quadrat, into a QP vector space, we can actually just sort of extend scalars and think of H as a QP rather than Q quadratic function on this Lie algebra and work with the Lie algebra instead of the mordal Vey group. Now, the thing about H is that on J of Q, it's a quadratic map, 
So I, I didn't say that these HVs are quadratic. I only said that H is quadratic. And you can compute H on a basis of the Mordell Bay group and actually write it as a quadratic map. Um, so you write some quadratic function Q and I put at the bottom of the slides, more precisely, you write some bilinear form and Q is related to that bilinear form. And what you can then do is you can say, well, if X has potentially good reduction everywhere, HV is trivial for V not equal to P, which means that H of Z equals HP of Z. And you can, you can consider the equation Q of log Z equals HP of Z. And both sides of that are p-adic analytic functions that are known to be equal when z is a rational point. And so this gives you a way to cut out the rational points um, inside the p-adic points. Um, and, it, and it's really, it sort of gives you part of, of Kim's method. However, if x has permanent bad reduction, you're going to actually have to consider hv for v not equal to p. And so you sort of look at Q minus HP and say, well, that has a finite set of values that it can take on. Now, our project at ISERM had to do with understanding these places of bad reduction away from P for certain kinds of curves and specifically Shimura curves and their Atkin Lehner quotients. Um, and so these Shimura curves depend on some, some integer D and for primes L dividing D, they have totally degenerate reduction which means that once you pass to an extension with semi-stable reduction, the reduction is a union of copies of P1. In particular, the reduction is not potentially good. It's, it's permanently bad. Um, but as I'm gonna mention on the next slide, there are some things that you can do when it has totally degenerate reduction. Furthermore, for these Atkin Lehner quotients, you actually expect to have R equals G. So it's a great case to try to apply quadratic Chevauté. And so in our ICERN project, what we do is we use sort of using the fact that they have totally degenerate reduction at L that tells us something about the L adic geometry. Um, and in particular, we, we sort of do something with, with the log crystalline cohomology um, and, and relate it to the graph homology of the dual graph of the semi-stable special fiber. Um, so there, there's some interesting stuff there. And, and using actually some, some results in, 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 um, in a paper in preparation of a few people um, that allows us to say something about the contribution of the piatic height at places of bad reduction. And this project is joint with the people mentioned on the slide. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Feel free to ask questions. Thank you, David. That was a wonderful talk. There was some discussion in the, the chat window, or we could just take other questions. Well, so so in terms of Grant Molnar's question, the, the when it says the bound is eventually sharp, I mean, Kim's conjecture is that for n sufficiently large, you, you get precisely the set of rational points as you intersect over all the Coleman functions, yes. But I don't think Kim's conjecture gives, it tells you which which lowercase n you expect to, to meet. Just some sufficiently large lowercase n. Yes, would anyone else like to ask a question? Well, there's a so question. I, 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 I should say I do have some thoughts, which um, is- just re Read the question once. Um, yes. So the question is, do you have any thoughts on what N is good enough in terms of data from the curve you are working with? Um, okay, so let me just say, I, I have some thoughts, not based on my ISERM project, but based on some of my other work with, with Don Cohn and Bevers. Um, and so what we were actually doing is, is we were trying to verify cases of Kim's conjecture in the case of P1 minus three points. And well, what happens is once you, you sort of, you do the step once and you get for, for some lowercase n, 
and you get some function. And that function has finitely many zeros. And so you sort of list what the zeros are and you might have some zeros beyond the set of, of in this case, S integral points. And then you get another function. And you don't actually have to apply Newton's method to the new function. All you have to do is show that the new function does not vanish at any of the extraneous zeros of the previous function. And so Kim's conjecture is true unless somehow this, 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 the, the next function accidentally happens to vanish at one of these points. And so the conjecture is sort of expected to be true unless some piatic analytic function just happens to vanish at a, at, at a point where it has no good reason to. And so the conjecture is sort of saying that, that you know, a function should not, it's got some network error, the, 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 it's saying that the function should not vanish at a point unless it has a good reason to. And so in some sense, maybe you would expect that sort of once you get a function that gives you finiteness, that the next function you get after that is going to give you precisely the, the set of rational points. That, that's what I might, I, I don't, you know, it could be false in some special cases, but in general, I would expect something like that. It almost has a probability one of being true. Um, I don't know how it compares to more Dalvey sieving, but I know a common, a common method is sort of to use Shabot in conjunction with more Dalvey sieving. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there's a question. Any ideas on, on how that compares to Mordell Um Well, great, David. Thank you so much for this talk. And we'll meet again in, in two weeks um, for the talks of Padma Srinivasan and Manami Roy. And I hope you all have a, a wonderful American Thanksgiving. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.